Beijing is again grabbing the world's attention, this time with the upcoming Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation, which is happening later this month and is actually based on the ancient Silk Road. Now, Beijing has over 3,000 years of history, so it's no surprise that some of the traces of the Silk Road can be found here even today. So today I'm going to show you three key historical sites here in Beijing which all have links to the Silk Road, but which is still relatively unknown to the wider world. We're here in Beijing's Royal Observatory dating back to the 15th century and what we can see here are eight pieces of large astronomical instruments all dating back to the Qing Dynasty. And out of these eight, actually all of them were made in accordance to European metrics and designs and six were made by a famous Belgian missionary called Ferdinand Verbius or Nan Huiren, his Chinese name. Verbius was also a master of artillery production all of the artillery supervised by him revealed top precision. Qing Emperor Kan Xi was supposedly more than satisfied with those artilleries when he saw them. The emperor is said to have put his Martin coat on Verbius, a sign that showed Kan Xi's high regard for the Belgian. Verbius was later promoted to the deputy head of the Ministry of Works. And speaking of foreign missionaries, many of those coming from European countries travelled to China using the Maritime Silk Road beginning in the Ming Dynasty. And many of these famous missionaries are actually buried here in northwest Beijing, including one Matteo Ricci. Now, he came to China in 1582 and is buried here. He actually became fluent in Chinese, even writing books in the language. And here, it's very interesting to see the coming together of two East and West cultures, with Chinese on the one hand and Latin on the other. Ritchie also befriended the renowned Chinese scientist Xu Guanqi, a friendship between East and West that is still talked about even today. And aside from Catholicism, many missionaries also brought advanced technology and science to China. But it also worked the other way around, with many travellers here taking new knowledge and cultural practices back home. Ritchie, for example, brought back classics from China, including the four books and five classics. And right here next to him is Johann Schall von Bell from Germany. And he was given the highest possible title awarded to a foreigner in the Qing Dynasty, certainly a man to follow. So in this cemetery, there are 63 tombs in total, with missionaries buried from countries, including Portugal, Italy and France. The Bridge of Lugo, or Marco Polo Bridge, is located 15 kilometers southwest of Beijing city center. Now, Italian traveler Marco Polo made much of this bridge in his travel log, also known as the Travels of Marco Polo. And in fact, it was over 700 years ago that Marco Polo first set out on his famously long journey from Venice with his father and his uncle. They travelled for four years before finally arriving at the great capital of the Yuan Dynasty, now called Beijing. Marco Polo travelled in China for 17 years, but over half of that time was spent at the capital. And Marco Polo had very high praise for this bridge in his book, even saying, over this river there is a bridge so fine, so fine indeed, that there are very few equals to it in the world. And it is very fine. If you look at these lions, actually there are over a hundred of them across the bridge and each one is unique. And some of the collections in Beijing's Capital Museum suggest the link between the Silk Road and the city dates back to over 1700 years ago. And Beijing was already a bustling metropolis in the 13th century during the Yuan Dynasty. And it is here that the Grassang Silk Road, the Maritime Silk Road and the Silk Road itself all meet which means there wasn't just a large-scale exchange of goods, there was also an exchange of east and west, which left its strong traces in the city, just as I showed you today.